Have you guys ever wondered how to build the third generation of blockchain or why cryptocurrencies really matter? Well, we have the CEO of Cardano to answer that for us and a lot more questions. Uh, can we please give a warm welcome to Mr. Charles Hoskinson? Thank you. Thank you very much. Cheers. <sighs> Hi, everybody. It's kind of my catchphrase these days, the Dr. Nick Riviera. How's everybody doing? So I just came in from California. It was a 17-hour flight, so I'm a little jet-lagged right now, but I think we'll have fun regardless. It's good to be here in Singapore. So a long time ago, when I was working at Ethereum, we had to make a decision of whether to incorporate in Switzerland or Singapore. And um, I guess you know how we chose. We chose Switzerland. But I always play the thought experiment of what, what would have my life been like and what would have Ethereum been like as a project had we incorporated here. It's a very lovely place, and um, I really enjoy the hospitality, uh, and I thank the organizers for inviting me here. Okay, so what are we going to talk about? What's today's topic? Well, let's talk about when I was a small boy. Let's start there. When I was a little kid, I grew up in a small town called Makawa. I was just recently there. It actually hasn't changed much in 22 years since I left. And I'd ride my bicycle to the library. It rained a lot in Hawaii. And usually when I finished schooling, I'd ride on over, usually in the rain, enjoying that nice little trip. And I'd go and rent a bunch of books, six-year-old, seven-year-old, and they had a limit, five books for a kid of my age. I get all five, take them, hold them for 21 days, come back, swap them out again. I really enjoyed it, but it was a lot of work. It was pretty dangerous too. Lots of cars, people would drive drunk. It was fun. So what's the point of that? Well, it took effort to get those books. A lot of effort. It was dangerous. It took time and energy. And I had to buy a bike. Parents bought it, so money. It turns out that information for the longest time throughout all of human history took time, effort, and money to move it. Then suddenly we invented a new piece of technology that brought the entire world together. It's called the internet. It's been around for a while. It's a pretty good invention. I like it. I, you guys probably use it too. What did the internet do? It made it free to move information to basically anyone in the world, anytime, any way you want it. That's a very transformative thing, and it's something that we haven't fully felt yet. See, when information could move for free, we started asking questions of, well, hang on a second here, haven't we structured society in a way? Haven't we structured human relationships, human progress, human governments, assuming that information is centralized, assuming that information flows from certain centers, whether it be big universities or capitals, privileged people who happen to live in the right places like London and New York. Suddenly now it doesn't matter where you're at. You can be in a small island off the coast of Madagascar and have equal access to information as someone who lives in New York City. It's a pretty amazing thing and it's really changed the world. But then in the 1980s we started saying, hang on a second here, why the hell is our financial system living in such a dire state? Why does it take time, effort and money to move money? Why does it take time, effort, and money to classify assets, to silo them? Why does it take time, effort, and money to establish identity and reputation? And why are all these systems so damn centralized? Why can't we do the same thing we did to information, to money? So, wonderful people like Hal Finney and David Chaum and others, not exactly household names, but they were pioneers for their time, started thinking really deeply about that problem. And they said, how do we decentralize money? How do we reinvent money, reinvent value, the representation of assets, identity? And so we saw things like PGP, we saw things like Digicash, we saw things like Bcash, and so forth. These things just started flowing. And every single one of them was compositional, additive. They built on top of each other. And then eventually, Eureka! In 2009, Bitcoin comes out. Nobody even really fully understood myself included, how profound that was. It was an aggregation of 30 years of effort to try to create something that was new. Now the world realizes we're at our all-time high, I think a half trillion dollars will pass that 
Dozens of countries are seriously competing. And it doesn't matter where you come from, your culture, your language. It doesn't really matter your philosophy, your religion, your business sector. Everybody says blockchain this, crypto that. It's pretty magical. So what the heck are we actually trying to accomplish? What are we really doing? What's the point of all of this? So back in 2011, that's when I first entered this space. I read the white paper and I said, yeah, that's a pretty good idea. I was kind of a Ron Paul guy. I liked gold. I liked alternative economics. So I said, I'll sign up for a meetup group. And I went. And there was two people who registered for it, myself and another person. And I was the only one who showed up. So I had a very lovely, engaging conversation with myself. And over the last seven years, I've kept that conversation up. It's become a, a little bit more verbose, and it's become a little bit more engaging and dynamic. And I think the point of all of this is for us to have a re-examination of the fictions that the world is built on. You see, the other story to tell is the story of us, where people came from. Long time ago, very long time ago, before we had cities in Singapore, before we had the airplanes and the trains and religions, there was over 20 different species of people, of hominids. And we were just one of them. And you know what happened is, we killed the rest of them. We beat them. Either outbred them, ate them, killed them in war. Didn't matter, we won. Why? Because we had one advantage over all the other ones. It wasn't that we were bigger and stronger, the Neanderthals were much stronger than us. It wasn't that we were smarter, some of them had larger brains. We were really good at imagination. We were really, really good at abstraction. You see, if you look at a chimpanzee group, or any of these old human species, they couldn't get larger than just a few hundred. They got to a few hundred, they'd split into two groups. But we, we humans, are really, really good at making up things like religions, sky gods, brown gods, instead of saying, hey, Let's just look at self-interest. No, let's die for the government. Let's die for the God. Let's have money. We made up all these things. And when you make up these things, suddenly you can trust and talk to people, work with people that you've never met, you know nothing about, you didn't grow up with. And guess what happens when you can trust and coordinate with people who you never grew up with? You can go from 200 people to an empire of millions and eventually billions. The world is constructed this way. Corporations are like this. Does Microsoft exist? Is there a little place you can go to and you can point to and say, that is Microsoft? You can go to their corporate headquarters. Okay, but where in the corporate headquarters is Microsoft? Is it the CEO's office, the chairman's office? No, it's made up. And the same for money. Does money really exist? It doesn't exist. It's pointless. There's just consensus that some piece of paper with often a dead person on it, or if you're from England, a live person, and then suddenly this is worth something? Well, this is a piece of paper. Why is this not worth anything? Because no one agrees that. So the magic of the cryptocurrency space, the magic of what we're doing here, is we're starting to pull the curtain back to the entire human species. Something that we all kind of know and we all kind of feel deep in our bones, that we're living on a house of fictions. We're pulling the curtain back and we're revealing it to everybody that you can make your own money. You can build your own government. You can write your own regulations. A great example is when we went to Switzerland, we talked to the regulators there and we said, have you guys heard of Bitcoin? And they said, no, just what we've read in the papers. And it wasn't very pleasant news because Mt. Gox had just collapsed. And now they have utility tokens and security tokens. We practically wrote the damn regulation through this self-regulatory organization there. We said, hey, look at all these money and jobs we can bring to your country. They said, that's a good idea. We should have some of that. Now, am I Swiss? No. Am I German? No. Do I speak Swiss German? No. But it was a good idea. It was a good fiction. And it was something that solved the problem for them. And so clever enough people decided to adopt that. Now they have Crypto Valley. And it's the same here in Singapore and it's the same for the rest of the world. So the true value of the cryptocurrency space, the true value of what we do here, is we're actually having a broader, explicit discussion about what the 21st century is going to look like. Who's going to be in control? How will we do business with each other? How will you secure your money? What does property mean? What do assets mean? What's the difference between a stock and a bond and a commodity and land? Why the hell do these things live in silos 
And they're on different exchanges traded by different people. They're all represented by the same thing. It's all just information. So why can't we have something turn into one thing and then turn it to another thing and trade them on a global market? We're having a big conversation about these things. And we're having a conversation of how will these things work on a global basis, not just in the United States, not just Russia or China or any of these other massive centers of power in a multipolar world, but rather, how is it going to work in a transnational way? See, I was just in Africa. I was in Ethiopia, and then after that I was in Rwanda, and Ethiopia was an amazing experience. I got to learn all about the coffee industry. Ethiopia has a million and a half coffee farmers, most of them on less than a hectare a day. And it's the strangest thing when you go there, if you actually tour them. On one side of the coffee supply chain, you have this incredibly sophisticated exchange built by a former Stanford grad, wonderful gal, high-tech fiber optic cables, big servers, well-educated people running it, usually from Stanford and MIT and other great places. And on the other end of the supply chain, you have these million and a half farmers who don't have internet, seldom have power, and they usually price out their coffee through a text message to a washing station to find out which one's going to give them the best price. And they grab the beans and carry them on their back, or they put them on a donkey if they have to go a little further, and they go and sell them there. These people live in the same ecosystem. And very soon, either we'll do it or someone else will, we'll model that entire supply chain. And in the process of doing that, putting it on a blockchain, suddenly we have meaningful discussions of, well, how do we identify everybody? Oh, well, we've just created digital identities for a million and a half people that didn't have them before. And then the World Bank comes in and says, you know, we would love to have more sustainable agriculture. Boy, we'd love to give you guys loans for sustainable agriculture. We'd love to stump coffee trees. That's where you cut them down. You let them regrow over a few years and get two to three times the yield. So that we can do that. We can do micro-insurance. We can do micro-lending. We now have the entire supply chain modeled out amongst the poorest people in the world. And that's just one little thing that turns to many things. That's just one little thing that was local, and it lived under an old collective fiction that hadn't changed much for a very long time. And now it's going to change, not just for them, but for everybody in the world, no matter where you're from or where you come from. It doesn't matter who you were born to, it doesn't matter the country you were born to, you're going to have access very soon, in the next 10, 20 years, to one of the largest, if not the largest, global markets. And you're going to have access to the same customers I do. You're going to have access to the same knowledge I do. That's what the internet brought us, and that's where we're headed. So then it begs the question of, well, how should we construct this system? What should it look like? Is the default state to this system that it's equitable and transparent and fair and free and that everybody can use it? Or is the default state that it's centralized or federated? That there's going to be gatekeepers of necessity plaguing the system, sucking value out like vampire squids? Well, what is it going to look like? And the answer is, I don't know. Because we have yet to decide that. Every generation has a challenge. In my grandfather's time, it was, who gets to run the world, the Nazis or the Americans? And then the next generation's time was, who gets to run the world? Is it the Americans or the Soviets? Then the Soviets collapsed, and we had different questions and different challenges. Mine has to deal with this whole damn terrorism thing, amongst other things. So, this generation's time is to decide, what will the world financial system look like? The default state is to centralize and to control. Right now, there are certain countries that shall remain nameless that are thinking really carefully about how do we create numbers and attach them to our citizens, kind of like a My Citizen score. All your social media, all your travel records, your political opinions, these things, they go into one little profile, they normalize all of it, give you a number. The higher the number, the better citizen you are. The lower the number, the worse citizen you are. Number gets too low, you can't travel. Number gets too low, they revoke your passport. Number gets too low, your taxes go up. Number gets too low, you lose your girlfriend. Not so good. And guess what? When money goes digital, number gets too low, they shut your money off. That's not a fiction. It's a reality that we will go to by default if we do nothing. I live in America. I live in Colorado. Wonderful place. Still got my boots on. Have a horse. It's a good place to grow up. Good place to live. I used to live in Virginia, and I remember every now and then, Virginia 
you'd have a drywaller. You'd have somebody who lives in a cash economy, just got paid for a long job, two, three months of work. Police would pull him over, and he'd have a bunch of cash in the car, and they'd confiscate it. It's called civil asset forfeiture. You have to spend six months to a year fighting the government to get it back. The land of the free, the cops take your money, and you have to fight to get some of it back, not all of it. Doesn't sound so free, does it? That's the reality that a lot of people live in. So it doesn't matter where you grow up, it doesn't matter which country you are in, countries will take liberties if you give it to them. So, we as a community, as the architects of the fictions of this world, must make a decision of where do we want to go and what do we want to do. Not just to transform our businesses, not just to transform our personal lives and enrich ourselves. Some of us in this industry have gotten insanely wealthy. We no longer need to do that. It's not the point. It's about what type of world do we want to live in. Do we want to live in a world where we control our own property and our own identity and our own reputation? Do we want to live in a world where we control our own assets? Or do we want to live in a world where we have a number stamped on our head and we've gamified being a citizen and if we get too high, we get great perks. If we get too low, we lose everything. That is the challenge of our generation. And there's a lot of technology that has to be built. The science of this space is fascinating. In fact, it's probably the most fascinating you could ever imagine. It's so interdisciplinary. You can have these great enriching conversations with programming language theorists and distributed systems experts, with cryptographers, with game theorists, with law and policy experts, all on the same day, all about basically the same thing. Like, what isn't a good identity? What does that actually mean? How much centralization do you require for a good identity? There's tons of projects that are thinking about it. Some are centralized, some are not. A great one called Uport. There's a dozen others. Okay. In the same breath, you can have a great conversation about consensus. I talk about this all the time. We have our protocol we created for Cardano called Ouroboros. We spent millions of dollars on it and years of research. Wrote in a half dozen papers, more, you know, write a half dozen more. And that's one flavor. Then you have DPoS, and then you have Casper and Tendermint, all of these crazy things. It's really interesting to think about. And they're fun to talk about. But what is so much more meaningful about these particular protocols isn't whether are they secure or not, or do they work or not, or are they performant or not. It's not how many transactions per second. It's who's in control. And that's the hard part. Proof of work has a flavor of it, a philosophy about it a narrative about it, a fiction about who should be in control, as does proof of stake, as does all these other things. And every little choice you make paints a beautiful mosaic, stone by stone, that ultimately configures a system that will decide who gets to run that system. Bitcoin is a great example of that. Ten mining pools control more than 50% of the hashing power. It's not decentralized. Not even close. There are more decentralized systems you could imagine, but the consequences are more expensive to operate. Less people can use them. They're less user-friendly. What about privacy? That's another design decision we have to make and think about. How private should your transactions be? We have all these regulators come up and say, tell us everything. But the problem with privacy is you actually don't know how private you need to be. As a thought experiment, imagine if you grew up in Iraq back in the 1970s. And they'd say, are you a member of the Ba'ath Party? And you'd say, oh, of course. Best party in the whole world. Saddam is our father. He leads us. You'd say these things because if you didn't, you'd get killed or you'd lose opportunity. So, of course, you'd get close to that party. Any sensible, reasonable person would. You'd pay lip service to it. And then fast forward to after America invaded and de the country. Are you a member of the Ba'ath Party? Oh, no, no, don't, don't know those guys, hate those guys. Why? Because if you were, you couldn't serve in any meaningful position. country was kind of purged of that. Same piece of information, same status. Clock goes in one direction, different results. So what if you publicly announced on an immutable ledger that cannot be changed for all to see that you were a member? You've basically written yourself onto a blacklist which you might not even know is coming for decades. Your children might not know it's coming. That's the challenge with privacy. So how private should things be? We have this global regulatory system, KYC, AML. God damn, those laws are shitty. I hate them. 
I really do. It's the craziest thing. It's like spy on your own customers, collect enormous amounts of information. We won't tell you what's good enough, and if you screw up, you get a big fine. Have fun. And by the way, we'll change the law every five, ten years, and just keep you on your toes. Okay. What's the point of that? Well, because we need taxes, and we need to understand what's going on, facts and circumstances behind who's doing business with you. Who's a good customer? Ah, it's not our job to tell you that, but we'll let you know when you're doing business with one of them, usually with a fine or jail time. Great, guys. Thank you. Well, guess what? We're moving to a completely new world, a global world, where it's becoming harder and harder to know who the good people are and the bad people are, harder and harder to know what the good money is, the bad money is. There's just too much of it. What if we had a notion of minimum viable escalation for compliance? What if instead of people, you thought about transactions? Imagine a world where you just ask questions about where the funds came from. Zero knowledge questions. Is the person over 21? Is the person a U.S. citizen? Is the money taxed? And you get yes, no. And every country has a list of questions you have to ask. And you can ask them in an automated way, and you gain only that knowledge. Blockchain is actually going to take us there in 10 to 15 years. And it's going to be very easy to implement these models and just look at compliance as a collection of questions and lists that the regulators update when they want to. And computers ask the questions, not people. It means you've taken something that for every three years you could buy Tokyo with, whole of Tokyo, and you've compressed it down to a challenge response protocol that we use every time we log in. Think about that. So where in all of that? Who's going to be in control? How much privacy will you have with your data? Are you going to hand it all to a big data warehouse that Estonia controls or America controls or Singapore controls, and at any time they can parse it, send it to anybody that they want to without your consent or knowledge? Or will you be in control of that? Both of these systems work. Both of these systems will be fast and low cost, and both of these systems will have functionally the same user experience. The difference is one of the systems you own your identity, your reputation, your data, and ultimately the response behind it. And the other system, someone else does. Which one's better? These are the decisions that our space is going to have to make on privacy, on, on compliance. These are the decisions we're going to have to make on control. So as we enter into the third generation of blockchains, leaving Bitcoin and leaving Ethereum and now going into the EOSs and the Cardanos and the IOTAs and the Ethereum 2.0s and so forth, we're going to start making an increasingly larger and a larger amount of these decisions. We're going to start making decisions about who's in control and how private do we need to be. We're going to start making decisions about how do we represent assets and knowledge and can assets be frozen, can transactions be rolled back and so forth. And what's most important in my view to the space is not necessarily the answers to these questions. It's that we actually know the answers to these questions as consumers of the systems. They're not hidden from us. They're there. They exist. So, I run a company. It's a company of passion, IOHK. Some of you have heard of it, some have not. We're an engineering and a science company. We have 160 people. We operate in 16 countries. Not quite as big as consensus. Hope we never get that big. I like to know all my people. And I travel a lot. And on one side of our company, we're a science company. We have labs at University of Edinburgh, Tokyo Institute of Tech, at University of Athens. And we do peer-reviewed research there, where we get the freedom to answer some of these questions in ways that we think are the most ethical. And on the other side, we're an engineering company. We build cryptocurrencies. Some of you you probably heard of, like Cardano. Other ones, probably not, like Zencash. And sometimes we consult, sometimes we construct. We build them like you'd build aircraft software, high assurance. So I uh, would like my legacy in this space not to be the founder of one thing or the other, but rather just to have that conversation with everybody and make people aware that we are now rewriting the fictions of how governments are going to work, of how your money is going to work, how your identity is going to work. And they will eventually set. And your children and your children's children will grow up with them, just like the people at the Bretton Woods Conference made decisions that we grew up with and our parents grew up with. That's probably the greatest legacy of the space and the greatest value of it. It's exciting, it's terrifying, but I think we'll be okay. 
Anyway, I have a few minutes left, and so I always like leaving a little bit of time for questions. So thank you guys so much for coming, and five minutes for questions. So make them good. Thank you. <laughs> Show of hands. Hello, hello. Are you can hear? Okay, great. Uh, yeah, thanks for the talk. Uh, I completely agree and I love the way you're going. Uh, but just a question on, uh, you say about architecture and decisions, and definitely there needs to be architecture and decisions made. But isn't also there's a, what is actually finally successful, more driven by consumer behavior rather than the best product out there, like VHS, Betamax. Right. You can build a great VHS, but then everybody, sorry, Betamax, but then somebody buys, everyone buys VHS because everybody else does. Yeah, but consumers don't know what they want. If you went to consumers in 2005 and you said, consumer, tell me what you want for a mobile computer, and they would be like, oh, well, I want a laptop, and maybe it has a keyboard here, and you have your, your turducken of computation. Would they have come up with the iPhone? No. Consumers are given choices, and they make decisions based upon the choices that they're given. The point of being an entrepreneur and the point of being a dreamer is that you have the freedom to give somebody a choice they never considered, a solution that they never considered to a problem they might not even know they have. Most people are not trained to think about the privacy implications of their behavior. This is why Facebook was so surprising to so many people. They're starting to wake up a little bit about the consequences of decisions they've already made. And as we progress through this global narrative and we feel the pain of our decision, some cases delayed, just like that person announcing they belong to the Bath Party. What's going to end up happening is people are going to start actually having very serious conversations. We're seeing it in every aspect of life. We live with a media model that invites people to go on one talk show or another, CNN or Fox or MSNBC, and cluck for five minutes about noise. Who did this? Who did that? Meanwhile, there's a completely parallel media model that's being built out with Sam Harris and Joe Rogan and Jordan Peterson, where they're having these deeply engaging conversations on podcasts, some cases three-hour conversations about topics as foundational as what is the nature of truth, postmodernism. What is the nature of being a virtuous and good person? It's almost as if we've gone back to Greece and we're having Diogenes lecture us in the marketplace suddenly. And you'd say, oh, well, that's a small elite group of people that listen to these things. No, because we got truckers and we got forklift operators. We got a lot of middle class people who have a bunch of time because they're doing boring things. And they can put on their headphones and listen. So when Peterson goes and lectures, 3,000 people show up, most of them middle class, not university professors. In fact, those ones usually don't come or they come to protest them. So we're seeing a parallel dark web of intellectuals form to talk about the nature of society and who we should be and what does it mean to be human and what does it mean to be virtuous and at the same time we see the cryptocurrency movement having that same discussion these wall street guys look at these valuations and they say oh god how can this thing be worth five billion dollars and ten billion dollars it makes no sense it only makes sense because people choose to make it make sense because there's hundreds of thousands of people that have just woken up and decided to price it that way so if you're talking about in terms of how many widgets do you have and talking about in terms of how many buildings do you have and where's the gold, it's meaningless. If you talk about it in terms of we have brought together 100,000 people to do something, that's a very meaningful thing. That's an army. That's something you can use to take countries down. But those people don't know what they want. They don't even know what the decision space is. They don't even know what the solutions can look like. And they have to have choice, thousands of choices, many of which will be blatant failures, some of which will be scams, and they'll figure it out eventually. What our duty is, is to be moral and ethical about the presentation of choices. It's kind of funny, we print our own money. Think about it, we're central banks, the cryptocurrency architects, yet everybody worships the ones that have become rich in terms of fiat. Look, this guy's on the Forbes list, he's a billionaire now, in terms of dollars. The whole point was to leave that system, yet we still worship people who got rich in the old system. So things are going to change, society is going to change, solutions are going to change, and yes, things do need to be made consumer friendly, but it will take time for that. The internet is a great example of that. We all knew in the 80s, the really people who were paying attention, that this was going to transform society. It still took two decades to see the web browser and Gmail and a whole bunch of other things materialize out of that. 
And it took decades still for that to completely solidify and become mobile and accessible to the remainder of the human race. And experiences are still evolving and changing. And the same will be true for our space. The difference is we're moving a little bit faster in this space, and we have actually a lot more people relative to that growth rate. All right, we have time for one more question. Thank you, Charles, uh, for wonderful keynote. Can you speak a little closer to the mic? Oh, yeah. Thank Thanks. you so much for wonderful keynote. Uh, I came only to listen your speech. Actually, we want to do collaboration. We are a bunch of uh, developers. We are 40 developers. We do development for our clients uh, on blockchain. And uh, to do collaboration with IOHK or the Cardano, how can we uh, contact you guys? I am trying from past two months, but it's so difficult to yeah. reach you guys. Yeah, you know, it's funny because um, when I first entered this space, I created, uh, I, I didn't know what to do and I didn't know who to talk to, so I created this thing called Bitcoin or How I Learned to Stop Worrying and Love Crypto. It was a free online class. I ended up getting 70,000 students and 5,000 emails, and it was just me and Brian Goss. He was a, he's a doctor over in Arizona now. And, uh, and I had to answer every one of those emails. It took me a little bit of time. It was like seven months to do that. And I was just a nobody, right? Now we've gotten a little bit bigger. And so I do get a lot of messages. So first I apologize that we haven't been able to get back to you yet. We actually haven't set up an official business development. I wish I had consensus as ability to manage business development. That's one thing we're not so good at. Um, and that's okay. Um, there's Dan Friedman over there. He uh, will talk to you after the presentation. And uh, he does business development with us out in Japan. But uh, in general, right now, our goals for Cardano are liquidity, utility, and uh, community. We're trying to increase the utility of the platform, increase liquidity of the platform, and grow the community as much as we can. Uh, part of that is growing the business development side. Some of it we do, and there's a partner firm called Emergo that does a lot of work as well. And if we're not suited, then Emergo can help you guys. Okay? Thank you so much for your patience, and sorry it took two months to talk to me. <laughs> well, guys, it looks like I'm out of time. Thank you so much. Sure.